star date, a time, a day. I did not do the math. Hello and welcome to Picard Week. Uh, we're really glad to be joining some other members of the Trek podcasting community this week. We're all chatting about all things John Luke Picard. Pickard. Pickard. We are the crew of the Star Trek Discovery Pod. I'm your, uh, I guess, hollow captain for the night, Mariah Gossett. Joining me on the view screen, we have Lieutenant Commander Clyde Haynes, Engineer Rocks, <laughs> uh, Mike Moody Garcia, former captain, currently um, ensign. I'll take ensign. Dang. I want, I want the least responsibility possible. So, <laughs> oh, I've been watching Enterprise, so it's not ensign, it's steward. They have people oh. who like serve dinner and stuff. So I'm the steward. Steward, stewarding the episode. Mm -hmm. uh, I appreciate the support, steward. <laughs> uh, but uh, today we're going to be discussing a hot topic as we are getting ready for the second season of Picard. And that would be Picard and the Q continuum and that intertwining relationship that they have with each other. Um, this is definitely a subject that is rife with a ton of material that we can dive into. Uh, we want to try to make some possible predictions of what we're going to see in season two uh, with the return of Picard's old pal Q. Uh, and to get us started, I figured we should travel back in time in the show, forward in time for us, which sounds like a very Q plot point to I'm 23. Already. You're welcome to 2364. Uh, and that's when Q first encountered the Federation, or at least the Federation encountered Q uh, when he appeared aboard the USS Enterprise D. And he warned the crew of the Enterprise that humanity should return to their home star system or they will be destroyed. And we get some uh, images of opponents that they will face along the way. Uh, and we also got to see some amazing outfits, which I think is the most important part, personally. <laughs> hey, puffy you know, shoulder we, pads are all the rage in the future. You know, we reviewed a lot of these Q episodes of TNG, and I think one Q Voyager episode mm -hmm. on our regular podcast, um, uh, StarTrekPod.co. And I remember when we revisited the pilot, which is our introduction to Q for TNG, <laughs> Uh, I think most of you guys were down on it, but I really surprisingly enjoyed it. I hadn't seen it in like a decade. And I thought at that point, Q was still pretty threatening. John Delancey was was fun and goofy, but yeah, he was actually pretty threatening. And from what I'm seeing from the the trailers and the promos in this in this new season of Picard, sure, he's fun, he's goofy, but as we went down the line with Q throughout TNG and especially Voyager, his uh, the, his menace, his threat kind of got pretty diluted. And that was fine. But I think this is going to be a reset for Q. Um, I mm -hmm. think the threat level is high again. Um, John Delancey is looking pretty um, and acting um, pretty sinister and threatening in these in these promos. Uh, I mean, he's making jokes and stuff, but it seems like he's really fucking shit up for Picard. And uh, I don't remember if we can swear on this, can we? Yeah, why not? I okay. think they swear over at a on a strong new pod. So, and I, and I like that. Do you guys want to see like goofy Q, more goofy Q, or do you want to see more threatening? Like it's a real threat, and the stakes are high Q. So I'll I'll jump in and say, I, you know, we we go back and watch a lot of Trek, right? It's kind of what we do. And kind of with our, our 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 patrons, we do a lot of watch alongs. And and so it's so interesting to have seen pretty much every episode of every Trek franchise. Maybe not everyone, you know, you are I think between us all, we've seen them all. Mike is definitely the DS9 connoisseur. Mariah is all things Voyager. Um, I have been forced to, to to watch Enterprise, and I do quite a bit of TNG. To go back and watch the beginning of when we were introduced to Q, in with TNG, and that not only the first season, which was really trying to find its footing and its voice and its tone, but that first episode, 
has been challenging. Like it was challenging to look at these characters who you get to a point where you know and you love and you're watching them as they're just trying to figure out, you know, where the holodeck is, things like that. Q in particular, to your point, Mike, was, was very interesting. His character over the course of several franchises really evolved and seemed to take on this this almost android like i want to be human characteristic whereas in the pilot to your point he was menacing it was threatening he he was ready to kill people like it was a very different cue whereas we start to see this jokester i mean i i i I, listen, I'll say this to answer your question directly, Mike. I like the safety of Jokester Q, the one who ultimately is like, oh, okay, I'll turn everything back. That Q, like, I, I appreciate that. But I think it's more fun to watch the more sinister Q, right? Yeah. The less yeah. of a friend Q. Well, the sinister Q, yeah. like, drives a plot engine, right? Mm hmm. Yeah, and I think I think that's what's so, you know, both controversial, but also like controversially perfect about Q is that there is that playfulness there, and there is that, um, it's it's menacing, but it's also like with a twinkle in the eye. Do you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. because even in that first episode, like the dramatization of everything, the costuming, like it's definitely to me reads as the the line that connects both the jokester, the trickster and um, the sinister all powerful being is this like line of campiness that runs through all of it for Q yeah. and like in the same way of, I, I don't know if y'all are into like John Waters films, right. And like the original divine stuff is like how like ridiculous it was, but then also how like boundary pushing it was. And, and I feel like there is that sort of, familial space that Q falls into where you're playing with evil, but evil with a wink. And, and that's yeah. at least it could also be because I was more introduced to Q through Voyager where he is much more like trickstery, a little like Playful. too into Janeway that makes me uncomfortable. Like, um, you know, that sort of element was much more my introduction. I remember it. Had, I don't think I'd ever actually watched the entirety of the pilot the whole way through of uh, of Next Generation until we did it for the podcast. And I was just like, this is the pilot. I cannot believe this is the pilot, you know, because it's so out there, even for someone because I watch a lot of the original series as well, which also loves to play with, you know, quote unquote, godlike uh, species and characters a lot so it's interesting to see how those themes sort of carried over and get culminated into this more modern portrayal of q it yeah. it makes me curious if the pilot to tng was made today right and without all of the fanfare i feel like now if you make you slap the Star Trek franchise label on something, you immediately get two seasons. But I I wonder today is if that was our first, I don't know, introduction to Trek since TOS. Does it get greenlit today? Because I mean, it was a bump. Like that was a bit of a bumpy pilot. Um, I mean, didn't Patrick yeah. St Patrick Stewart? I think was convinced they weren't going to get more than one season of that show when it first started. Yeah. So yeah. fans I, revolted. It felt so different. It looked different. Like even behind the studio production, like there's a great documentary on this that William Shatner, quote unquote, directed. Um, mm -hmm. That is all about the first season or the first two seasons of TNG. And they pretty much got everybody who was involved in those first two seasons. And they're like, behind the scenes was a shit show. They had no idea what we were doing. Um, the tone was completely off. We didn't get our shit together till season three. Um, so, yeah, it was kind of a mess. But so I guess I saw that documentary and I've read a lot about the making of the show. And so when I revisited that pilot, I, I had more appreciation for it. I knew like the stakes these actors and writers were up against. And with Gene Roddenberry, Roddenberry you know, who was great and created this franchise, but really just trying to insert 
himself so much into this first season and the issues that he brought into the pilot and everyone was kind of fighting upstream to make the best thing they could, you know? So it gives me a little more appreciation for it. I, I, I just bring that up because it's so interesting that what we're talking about is a show that, you know, a decade plus later was spawned by, this show right tng and and not even really much tng when we talk about picard it's not it's not a show that was spawned by tng really right so i would look and say ds9 voyager like those are those are tng spinoffs right picard is a spinoff of captain john luke picard right so when you think about where he was and the character he was in this first episode, as we kind of look at that, and to think about Q being a part of that ride, fast forward now to having a show that is ultimately about Jean-Luc Picard and the introduction or the reintroduction of Q coming back from that first Rocky pilot. It's, it's yeah, like are we going to have, is the story going to be a bookend, right? The trial never ends. Is a trial still going on? Will we see it end? Probably. I mean, I think it's great that Q's coming back. I find it exciting. I think, Mariah, something that you mentioned, like with uh, talking about John Waters and such, Q is as transgressive as like a Star Trek character from that era can get, right? Yeah. It's total. That's what makes him so much fun. He's dangerous, but he has so much fun um, being a threat and bringing so much uh, flair to it. Um, and that's what I want out of this show. You know, I want, you know, I want some more hijinks happening on Picard. I want more fun. And I definitely want John Delancey's energy to kind of uh, get the show a little spark since season one was kind of drab for me. Yeah. I'm also, cause I've almost felt like the tone of Picard so far that um, has almost matched up more with a lot of like the TNG era, like movies um, more so than the show. Would you? I would I debate like... that. I think the TNG movies, they're kind of hit and miss, but one of them will play out like a long episode, which is fine. And then the others will be like action movies. Um, definitely the production is there and there's, but I don't know, uh, maybe in pace pacing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I wanted to kind of circle back to how Q is introduced to us and then continues to grow throughout the, the series. And so one of the things, and y'all already brought this up is we eventually get Q as, as human, right? There's this weird fascination he has with the, with the concept of being human and eventually he is punished and, and has to live as a human for a certain amount of time. Um, and so I wanted to see, I'm not as familiar with those episodes, but if y'all had some thoughts, uh, about that particular time frame in our kind of cue knowledge force specifically about how he interacts with Picard. I, I would say I, I am somewhat familiar with them and we've, we've gone back and kind of looked at them somewhat recently. It, it's, we, it's weird because when we typically think of someone trying to be human, we think of, you know, the typical trope of an android, right? The data conundrum, which is done so in a way that is, it, it's revered. It's this, the, this ultimate goal, right? Is to be human, to find their humanity. Where this is different because what we see with Q is it's, it's, it's punishment. It is, it is, he's been, it's, it's almost like, if you keep doing that, your hand is going to get stuck like that, right? Or your eye is going to get stuck like that. It's like he's had this fascination with humans, right? This almost like a pet you torture a little bit. And as his punishment, it is to become said pet. And so it's, it's almost like a, a science experiment to him. He's not and he's looking he's trying to figure out you know how to get out of it basically or how to manipulate it but it's he does it he never approaches it as like with this reverence or reflectiveness 
that you would think of someone who's in that situation. So it's a very different. He's still the jokester, the prankster, even just without powers. Right. He, he does take it for granted, for sure. There is that one episode where he is made human. But and for the most part, he hates it and he takes it for granted and he's a dick. But there's this great scene that I'm remembering in that episode where he and Data um, begin to bond a bit. And they bond over the idea of their own perpetuity because they're probably not going to die anytime soon. But humans know that there's an end date. They have an expiration date. And so they have a chat about that and how that makes them different and sets them apart and gives them some unease or anxiety. And at that point, Q starts to develop uh, a better sense of what it means to be human and why we act, why we act, um, because we, we're we human. We all get sick. We all die. And that, even if it's not always driving us, it's always in our mind or in our subconscious. Um, and when he starts to realize that, um, he starts to, I guess, grow a little bit, you know, and not take his own foray into humanity for granted. And he starts to kind of accept it. Until the Q continue and come back half an hour later and give him give him his powers back, of course, because come on, you got to have Q with powers. Yeah, I also wanted to to bring up because someone that Q definitely has an interesting relationship and rivalry with beyond just um, Picard, and we'll eventually get to the 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 bromance of Picard and, and Q in our discussions. Do not worry, everyone. Um, but Guinan is back for this next season. We've seen that in the previews. And uh, they have a very complicated relationship as beings that seemingly have one longer lifespan, but also some very interesting abilities. Um, and I always thought that I'm hoping we get some more about their relationship or maybe some insights um, I'm also just really stoked to see Whoopi Goldberg back <laughs> on Star oh. Trek. I've I've been a Whoopi Goldberg fan for a very long time, right? I think that my first Whoopi experience was a movie I, I won't really recommend, but it was definitely Jumping Jack Flash, right? So I, I go I go way, way back with Whoopi. So if you're telling me you're bringing Whoopi back into this as a role that I thought was, was really important, right? Um, I'm excited for it. I think it's, it's great. Like the... The Whoopi Goldberg character, you know, I am not one to promote the idea of a wise black Pixar owl type character in a TV show. But um, I thought she did add some wisdom um, to the show. And I think that when we think about Picard season one, you know, when we think about some of the things that it, it was missing. Right. I think that. Um, because we uh, we are used to Picard being this wise character, doling out wisdom, who sees around corners that others can't, and we get to experience almost in, from a first person standpoint. Guinan on TNG really allowed us to go, okay, well, this is who he goes to for advice, a trusted advisor, um, and I felt like we needed that, especially because he got put into a position in the first season of Picard where he didn't really like he so often had no idea what was going on and was tortured by his mistakes and whether or not he and his own mortality now we get a sense of having this character that is going to provide something i'm all for this i also have a ton of questions about how this works um from the simple you know, and really for both Whoopi and John Delancey, is their characters are basically immortal, right? The actors are not. And so while I love Whoopi, we all age, right? Whoopi, probably more gracefully than some, but we all age. John Delancey as well. How does that play a role in this, in, in what we're doing? I'm curious. So I have questions, but I'm Just excited. Does Guinan though? I thought is she fully immortal or just has like no. a very long, no, not lifespan. long lifespan. Immortal enough for our right. purposes. I yeah, mean, she's like several hundred years old by the time we meet her, yeah. and she yeah. looks like she's thirty. You know, 
I'm sure it'll be some sort of a, I feel like that's where that like trickster comes in with Q. It'll be like, oh, I'll, I'll make myself look old because you're old <laughs> and make you feel yeah, more comfortable. Yeah. You know? I, I love that Guinan's back, especially with Q, because if Picard is going to Guinan after he's met with Q, Mariah, I think your questions are going to be answered. Like he's looking for answers. You know, he's going to be like, Guinan, I know you fucked with this player before in ways that I didn't. What can you tell me? How can you help me? Um, and she she's Guinan. She has tricks up her sleeve and she is wise, wiser than any other character um, on TNG was. So she's going to help him out. But another reason I love Whoopi and Guinan being on this show is that it gives us a chance to be. Well, her character on TNG always gave us a chance to see Picard in a more intimate fashion because whenever he spoke with her, it was uh, it, they were friends and she was on the ship, but she wasn't under his command for, you know, really. And um, it, he was always seeking counsel um, and he was always in a, a somewhat vulnerable position that you don't necessarily always see him in. Um, and that was different and uh, added a different dynamic to the show. So I love that she's back. And I think we're going to have Picard back in that zone with her. And also Q, John Delancey brings every single emotion in the emotion rainbow out of Jean-Luc Picard. So it's, he's just a wild card. And I think that's what this show needs. It needs an injection of the fun of, of what's going to happen of, of like, I'm really excited anything can happen. Yeah. And I, and I wanted to get to probably um, one of our favorite subjects is this sort of bromance, romance, pl complicated platonic love that is Picard and Q. And, and I feel like the episode for me that really encapsulate that is the one where Picard has to go back in time and, st and uh, in order to sort of save his life going forward. Right. He, we get to see him as like a, a, a youth at Starfleet Academy making mistakes and and they Fight have this more seconds. yeah and have this like you know Q and, and Picard I feel like really have a tete-a-tete -tete in that episode where they're just like trying to outsmart each other to make this thing work by the time you get to the end of it um and Q's in Picard's bed at some point as well I, I believe <laughs> so that's <laughs> the the scene to spawn a thousand gifts <laughs> Picard like clutching the covers like yeah <laughs> I, very, I, very you, memeable. Uh, Tapestry is the name of that. Episode. Yes. Look, I, I think that what we got, and I think the writers did this excellently. It, it's almost as though they understood that Picard was becoming this really Kirk-like character, and maybe even and, and maybe even more Kirk than Kirk, right? Like you talk about it. I mean. If you do a Mount Rushmore of Star Trek captains, if you did a Mount Rushmore of Star Trek officers, to me, the overwhelming majority would probably, like, if you rank them and said, okay, we're going to take the top four, Picard's probably number one prior to the show Picard, because I think it was, I think there was such an awe, and it's not a shot at the show, but I think there was such an awe about him and a nostalgia about him and a remembering about him from TNG in certain a way that he felt almost flawless. He was definitely hero-like, right? And you're like, man, that was my captain. And you, you know, as you go back and rewatch, you're like, okay, well, he had a little bit more flaws. I think what they did, instead of making him really more flawed, you had to give him an adversary that pushed him, right? That, and if you think about it, he didn't, Picard's, Picard doesn't get angry very often. Usually when he gets angry, Q's involved. And so I think that they've created this character in Q that really is the only foil he's ever really had. And I think that's important. We talk about that bromance it, it, and it's, it's not an evil malicious vindictive foil right it's it's got a little big brother bully foil right it's that cousin that comes to visit so often that just drives you crazy it makes your life turned upside down that's who q is you know and it's 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 amazing and i think it works really well and they've pulled it off in a way that is seems fresh i'm excited to have that dynamic 
in Picard. Well, Q keeps coming back to Picard, right? Because he gets a charge out of him. Q um, asks asks Picard to represent all of humanity for a reason. He likes being around them, and he knows that he can typically overcome whatever Q throws at him. And that's surprising and new and fun and different for Q. And it gives him a charge. And we know that Picard is a guy who, um, he's not a proud man, but he does like to achieve, right? The the, the currency um, in TNG era Star Trek is uh, our reputation, our goodwill, what we can achieve, what we can learn. And Picard is all about that. So what other adversary, like you were saying, Clyde, is going to make him you know, uh, push him to a level where he's doing all those things all the time, where he's really learning and pushing himself and going beyond the boundaries of any other human. It's Q. So it's almost a symbiotic relationship. Every time Q um, shows up and pull pushes Picard's buttons, Q is getting a charge out of it. And he always learns something new and he grows. And same thing for Picard. You know, he, he fucks up Picard's world. Picard figures it out. They have kind of a mutual respect for each other. And Picard himself also grows from the challenge. Um, and that's a, that's a dynamic that has served TNG really well. And I think it'll serve this for this uh, second season of Picard pretty well too. I got a question for you guys, Mariah. And I'm, I'm pretty curious about what you think about this. So we, we, we've been talking a lot about Picard and we've been talking a lot about Q. And while the show is called Picard, we do believe that there's a bit more of an ensemble, right? Or we're, ho- we're hoping for an ensemble, right? So you've got Rios, right? You've got... Um, Girardi. Girardi. You've got... Um, Seven. Seven, right? And then the... the his, Rafi. His, Rafi. That's what I was looking for. Elnor. You've got Rafi and you might even have Elmore, right? Um, I mean, who knows, you know, and maybe some other, some new people. I don't, I don't know, but you've got this, this group, how are they going to react to Q? Right. And, and I, I asked that to Mariah because, you know, seven has interacted with Q before, I believe in Voyager. Right. That's what I'm trying to remember. Um, I think she's pretty sidelined in those episodes. Yeah, I don't, I don't, don't really remember, remember like any yeah. key interactions between the two of them, but I am very interested to see, like, you know, I'm assuming Seven is aware, you know, and has an idea of what to expect with a Q interaction at this point. Yeah. But how will they interact with each other? I'm not 100% sure. I think it's going to be very interesting because Seven does have. I mean, pretty incredible intellect as well, because she she does still remember quite a bit from being a part of the collective and and her knowledge base was something that was often utilized throughout Voyager. And so to see sort of that melding of all of those minds together, I think is going to be very interesting for whatever this continuing trial, I'm assuming, is uh, is going to happen um, because the the trial never ends. Uh, So what what this whole interaction is going to be and the other thing that's interesting to me going into season two is we do know that the Borg queen has been promoted to be coming back right we've seen promo images there's something going on there is it all just in somebody's head or is this actually happening we don't know any of that yet to be determined right so if you're getting this like melding of all of these like huge juggernauts of of Picard's captaincy really like all of these going huge all out. players that are all coming together into this one big problem to solve i think it's gonna be very interesting because we've just come off of this big season where picard had to face these bigger mistakes he made later in his career where he seemingly did not have all of these people in his sphere q wasn't meddling that we know of in the destruction of these planets and all of these other things that were going on and so uh i'm I'm very interested to see like how this is all going to take shape to 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 kind of your i I just answered your question with another question clyde but (laughs) (laughs) do i have another question and that's true like just you know the characters that we know 
from previous series that are on this show have grown mm -hmm. and changed, especially Seven. Yeah, uh, she's become really human now, and especially mm -hmm. Picard, who has somehow become not so human in the last. And technically not human. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Like, what is he like? It... So then, how does he then represent human? So is this right, uh, a exactly. trial for the mm -hmm. synthetics? Like, what right. is Ooh. the the bigger question here? Right. Is it going to be Picard? I'm. Uh... <laughs> Picard, you've lost a trial of representing humanity because you are no longer human. Right. And you can't represent humanity anymore. Or what is that perspective going to be? Uh, the perspective of Picard, um, like, who is he? Is, are we going to see an, an identity crisis happening? Um, are we going to see? I just am very interested to see how Q reacts to Picard now that he is kind of a synthetic life form. When I, Picard I, always represented the best of humanity. Uh, according to Q, I I would say I'm interested to see if there's a passing of the torch, yeah. Right, and is there is it at this point does does someone else do a better job of representing humanity? Right, like to me, I I almost would think that was it Soji. Um, mm -hmm. Well, she's synthetic too. She's synthetic, but she seems to have a humanity that that may surpass everyone. Right. But it could be Girati. Right. Like, I, I have no idea what it is, but I'm also curious. Not is It's not Girati. I, I mean, mean, she's just murdering people and not <laughs> having any consequences. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it, it'll be interesting. She loves them and kills them. I mean, then you've got Rios. Right. I mean, he seems like a very different character that Q to interact with Q. Um, I almost I kind of want it to be seven in some ways. I, I know it's the mm. show is called Picard. It's not called seven of nine, although I would love a show that was just called seven of nine personally. Yes. Um, all about it. Bring it. But she is someone who's had to figure out how to be human again. And isn't that the largest test of humanity is if yeah. it was stripped away from you and how do you regain it? And, and fight to regain it. Right. Yeah. Like not just have not just like, oh, like she had to really want it. Mm -hmm. Are you motivated to regain it? And why? That's a deep question. Yeah. I, I would love to see that explored in this, especially with Q. See, Q's a great like thematic and story engine for Star Trek. Right. He just comes in and his whole thing is like, oh, you humans, you're bullshit. Prove to me you're not. And that makes the characters um, be their best and stand out and he always pushes our crew up against a wall and he's always such a threat and they always through their human ingenuity fight back and they win um and, and, and he's just a great like threat and story engine and i think it you know some people say it's like a gimmick bringing him back i just it's a smart thing to do um this guy this guy I mean, is a great threat he's a great story engine he's a great even the actor just somebody great to bounce off of and give the show new energy and that's what you want i also think i mean he was such an important key part of of next generation and throughout the the 90s trek and so it's like if you're going to tell the story of captain picard you have to eventually involve q in some way shape or form um so I, I, I agree with you, Mike. I think it's a smart decision to bring him back. I'm very interested in how it's going to sort of meld together because in, in a similar way that we just talked about seven, like prior to becoming a synthetic Picard also, you know, became Borg and had to regain his humanity. And that's another yeah. kind of test of his sort of his strength and representation to, to Q and the continuum. Um, I do sometimes wonder if the other like, members of the continuum are sometimes just like to this particular queue like hey man like what's the fascination like what is hold hold your horses and so i wonder i, I want to know where this queue has been in this time frame right it feels like this is a long time for picard to go without a queue interaction um between the last time we saw Q and in this and this new appearance, right? It'd be nice cool. to learn that like every year they take a vacation together, you know, <laughs> <laughs> he just shows up every summer and they go to Riza and hang, they, you know, they have a family reunion. Yeah. Um, like I, I actually think this is a smart decision. To bring him back. Cause I think he fits more in with this show than maybe any other show. 
right? Because I, although I like his appearances on lower decks, that's also fun. Yes. (laughs) Well, because I mean, I, I think when we think about, you know, we are Star Trek Discovery Pod and we, we do a lot of Star Trek Discovery and we on Star Trek Discovery, we talk about the cool fight scenes. We talk about the ship to ship combat. We talk about the action, right? And I think what you get with Q is much more introspective. It's, it's much more philosophical, right? Mike, to your point, he's trying to say, he's basically asking you a question, the same question over and over again, right? Is why is humanity special, right? What is it about your humanity that, that anyone should pay attention to? Why shouldn't we just wipe you off the face of the earth? And that is not a, that's not a battle scene. That's not an action sequence, right? You don't need a, a super fancy starship, right? To do that. It's action that, of the mind, bro. Right. Well, that, but that's what Picard is. Picard has never been about the super, you know, you know, the super sequence choreographed fight scene, right? The ship to ship combat. And so I think he fits in here where you're you're more asking questions and trying to figure things out and it's more of a chess match mm-hmm. right the the dialogue between characters that fits Picard probably more than any other series we don't want to see that on strange new worlds right we don't want to see that necessarily on the not ever going to happen but often wished for section 31 show Right, right. We we, we want to see much more like fight scenes with batlefs and samurai swords and who knows what else. I don't, you know, there there's like an interesting balance I I think can be struck to to your point. I feel like um, DS Nine does a good job of of sort of having that balance of like a lot of internal struggles that intellectual happening, and then there's also some fun fight sequences there, but. I get what you're saying with um, this particular show. Although I thought some of the fight sequences were some of the more exciting things from last season. So it'll be interesting to see them weave Q into this sort of prestige drama, high, you know, caliber special effects Trek world that we we've now come to, to know and love. And what does that look like in this particular time and place? I hope their budget is was big this season because you could do anything with Q. You know, I want to see some yeah. wild let me see some wild effects, right? Well, to, to that point, Mike, I think what's interesting is you're introducing a Q character where the technology mm-hmm. in filmmaking has is vastly vast. different. Yes. Like yeah. it's not even the same, you know, galaxy. You know, this is beyond the galactic edge. It's, it's a- not even the same screen ratio anymore. <laughs> It's not. And so what you can do, like, you know, Q's biggest thing in DS era and TNG was the ability to make things reappear and disappear largely by a very (laughs) snapping, a very cheap film process. It's like, okay, everybody stop. We're going to (laughs) cut. We're going to move it out. Nobody move. Nobody move. Nobody move. Bring that cactus in here. Okay. Action, (laughs) make it sparkle in in After Effects, right? But now we have like what he can do is so beyond that. Like it'll be exciting. Like to your point, I hope they have the budget because, I mean, to me as a writer, your imagination can just go wherever you want it to go, right? You're not bound by the technology anymore. So this could be, you know, for an omnipotent being, like go nuts, like wow us. Big playground, big playground. For sure. Well, that was the end of my list of Q things to chat about. Do you all have anything else that you feel like we've left on the table? And then do you have any official predictions you want to lay down as we prepare for season two? That's what I I was thinking about. I think we need a, we need a Mariah theory for Picard season two. Okay. Not to put you on a spot, but to totally put you on the spot. Before we get to predictions, I will say, Mariah, you brought up the Q continuum. You know, I'm curious if we'll see other cues, mm-hmm. right? And will whatever he does, ultimately, will Q be reprimanded for again bothering the humans? That's a good question. Curious. That is a good question. Perhaps the reason he is seeing his old friend is he has fallen 
into trouble again. And the only person he can turn to in a time of need is his old pal, John Luke Picard. John, well, that sounds Picard. like a Mariah prediction. And I think that's the Mariah prediction. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. Um, my uh, crazy galaxy brain theory is that we're, we're going to see um, David Cronenberg, a.k.a. Kovic, show up and he's Ooh. a Q. It's be a crossover. Ooh. Okay. Ooh. It's got to be a Q. My prediction is we will see three TNG mm. and one non TNG characters this season on Picard, not including Guinan. So I'm Name like, I'm to, ooh, no, I can't because I, I would, but I'm going to have to say uh, Jordy LeVar Burton because, you know, that's like my hero and i don't think that's gonna happen <laughs> so <laughs> i think we would all know yeah. if that was gonna happen yeah we we would know about it and so i i feel like i'd lose one right there right my guess but, is robert picardo he's a yeah, he's a hologram he's but he's always game he's been campaigning for it what yeah. do you think mariah who do you, what's your one guess what what oldie but goodie are we gonna get back hmm I would, I mean, I feel like we got Kate Mulgrew back in the mix right now. She's already like doing some stuff. I wouldn't mind seeing Admiral Janeway I hang out with happen. us. We've Be already got seven. Too, yeah. We got seven of nine. I feel like you can yeah. just merge my two things together for me. <laughs> and I mean, we're I'm not going to see an alternative timeline with um, seven married to Chakotay. What is he up to? Robert, he's doing some voice work for uh Yeah, he works. Um uh Prodigy as okay. far as like stuff that's going on here. But Oh yeah, that's yeah, cuz you got the Okay, yeah. I've seen he, him on like t like he does like guest stints on procedural mm -hmm. TV shows and independent films. He works. I I'm, I'm going with Tuvok for no real reason hmm. whatsoever. I like Tuvok. What about Tuvok? <laughs> Jeez. Justice for two Vix. No, and no <laughs> Neelix ever again, please. No. Neelix is the shit. No. Neelix is great. All right. Well, I like all of these predictions. I hope they all happen because then that would be some fun chaotic energy right there. <laughs> <laughs> More chaos to the chaos. That'd be a vibe um, for sure. Clyde, do you want to tell people where they can follow us on social media? If you enjoyed this, thanks for tuning in for Picard Week. We appreciate the spot uh, to our other Trek podcast families. We hope you uh, enjoy the rest of Picard Week uh, and continue to watch all of the great content coming out. But Clyde, where can people find us on the Internet? Yes, if you want to hang out with us, you want to talk to us about Star Trek, you can hit us up at Star Trek Pod um, and all of our socials, Instagram, Twitter, Come hang out with us. We have a, a, a podcast. Um, you can hang out with us on Facebook and YouTube. Subscribe to our channel. Come hang out with us. We talk Trek a lot. StarTrekPod.co. And yes. if uh, we also do, Clyde, you, you mentioned that we do um, Star Trek watch alongs almost every night in our private mm -hmm. Slack group. Mm -hmm. If anybody wants a group of like awesome, positive uh, Trek fans to watch Trek with like almost every night of the week, um, just go to patreon.com slash Star Trek pod and uh, you can join up for two bucks an episode and have fun every night and also get a bunch of bonus content from uh, Star Trek Discovery Pod. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of fun. I mean... Yeah, I mean, you get to watch along. You get to um, laugh. I mean, tonight they're watching the original series, uh, the season one, episode three, where no man has gone before. Um, I mean, it's there's just a lot of we get to talk. And I think the key word that Mike said was positive. So if you want to hang out with some people who are positive, come hang out with us in, on our Slack channel. Yeah, and, good and people. Shouts to Strange New Pod for having us on and organizing all this. Yeah, yeah. this has been super fun and um, love the folks at Strange New Pod. Uh, both our patrons uh, include special comic book chit chats that myself, Brittany and Giraffe do from, from their podcast as well. And we have a great time uh, doing some crossover stuff. So I'm just glad that we're a part of a nice 
community, like a true Star Trek podcast community. It's really nice that we all get to, to hang out and support each other. Um, but yeah, check us out if you enjoyed this. StarTrekPod.co, like they said, we'll be covering the rest of this season of Discovery. We're going to dive into some Picard coverage as well. And uh, until next time, live long and prosper. <laughs>